let me start, right? We're going to continue exactly where we left off. But here's a quick recap of everything that we looked at in the first class. Neural networks have taken over most AI tasks these days from uh, things like speech recognition, machine translation, uh, interpreting images. These are the easy ones. Even things like guiding uh, self-driven cars, the computer vision that, have, that powers self-driven cars, and even creative stuff like drawing art. All of these things have currently been taken over by uh, neural networks, things that were previously assumed to be purely in the domain of human expertise. In every case, the neural network is this box that takes in some input and produces an output. It can take in a voice, it produces a transcription. It takes in an image, produces a, produces a caption, et cetera. So what's in these boxes? These boxes are functions. They take an input, they produce an output. So what are these functions? We saw in the last class, we argued in the last class that all of these functions are fundamentally human functions powered by the human brain. So maybe this is something we should emulate. And so in their basic form, neural networks try to mimic the network structure of the brain with lots of elements which are connected to one another. So here's what the brain looks like. It's composed of a network of neurons uh, where individual neurons have the structure that's shown to your left. They have uh, lots of incoming connections. When the aggregate incoming, uh, incoming signal exceeds a threshold, these things fire and activate downstream neurons. So in our computational model, we had a similar structure. First, we had a model for the, uh, for the neuron itself. The neuron was modeled by a perceptron where you had a number of inputs. Each input had a corresponding weight. So what the neuron eventually saw was a weighted sum of all of its inputs. And if the weighted sum exceeded a threshold, the neuron fired. So this was the basic simple unit, the perceptron. But the actual network itself was a network of these basic units. Uh, so it was a network of perceptrons, generally a multi-layer perceptron. Now, as for the individual units themselves, uh, how do these individual units operate? These are just perceptrons. We saw that you can think of it this way. Uh, you have each unit have several inputs coming in. So eventually, it's going to com consider a weighted combination of inputs, summation wi, xi. If this weighted combination of inputs exceeds a threshold, some t, then the neuron is going to fire. But then I can rewrite it slightly differently. Instead of saying uh, something like this, something instead of saying summation wi xi greater than or equal to t, instead of asking this question, I can say summation wi xi minus t greater than or equal to 0. They are exactly the same question. And so you can think of the neuron as something like this. It actually computes an affine combination of the inputs. Now, what is an affine combination? Anybody? Pardon me? What's an affine combination? Pardon me? Can you speak up? I can't hear you. Not a linear function? So Rohit, what's an affine combination? So what's a linear combination of inputs? Anybody? Degree one. Degree one. So basically, it means when I have a linear combination of variables, it means that the uh, combination of inputs, when, they, when that combination of inputs equals 0, that locus is a hyperplane that goes through origin. Now, instead of having it go through origin, if I, this is linear, right? Instead of going through origin, it goes off origin. That's affine. That's the basic difference. It's still a hyperplane. The hyperplane is no longer going through origin, right? So this one, when I think of that z over there, is that z an affine combination or a linear combination? Yes? That's an affine combination because that says that the summation of inputs becomes t, right, not 0. So when the summation of inputs is equal to t, 
then the summation of inputs minus t becomes zero. So that line, that, that locus is going to not go through origin. That's an affine combination. So now I can rewrite my perceptron like so. Instead of saying that I have the summation of inputs minus t and it's going through a threshold function. This is the same as saying I first compute an affine combination z. So right here I have z equals summation wi xi minus t. And then this function, the z goes through a function theta and the actual output is theta of z where theta has this property that it's 1 if z is greater than or equal to 0, 0 else. So in other words, if I plotted theta, this is z, this is theta of z, it's going to look like so. Correct? So I can think of the entire perceptron as a two-step process. First, you compute an affine combination of the inputs. Then you put it through this, now, this, through this threshold function. And once you decide that you're going to use a threshold function, you can use other kinds of functions. Why do I need to use this function? I can use a smoother version of it. That's my sigmoid. So now this function, yes? I can't hear you. Can you? Uh, this one? Now can you say it? All right. Mm -hmm. So now I can actually replace the theta by some other function. In this case, uh, a sigmoid, which has this shape. But you know you're not restricted to a sigmoid. You can have other kinds of functions, which are like these, which, are, which we have on the, uh, on the slide. The leftmost is a sigmoid. The one in the middle is a tan h. The difference between a tan h and a sigmoid is that a tan h is simply a sigmoid shifted so that the middle is now 0 and not 0.5. Or even the ones to the extreme right, where the output is not bounded but can go off to infinity in one direction or the other, right? So it doesn't matter. The whole point is the perceptron can be thought of as this, this structure, which first computes an affine combination of the inputs and then puts the affine combination of inputs through a function that we will call the activation function. The basic simple perceptron has a very simple activation function. It's a threshold, for, it's, a, it's a step function where the output is 1 if the input is uh, non-negative and 0 otherwise. Okay, for the purpose of this class, for most of this class, we will continue to assume a threshold activation function because it's really easy to understand threshold activations. But everything that we say will generalize to other kinds of activations and we will get to that towards the end of the class. So we understand the notion of a perceptron, right? What is a multi-layer perceptron? It's a network of perceptrons typically layered, and we like to think of it as, you like, we like to think of the multi-layer perceptron as having a structure as such as like one of these two where you either have one input or multiple outputs. We have names for these layers. The outermost layer whose outputs you actually see, that layer is called the output layer. All the intermediate uh, variables whose outputs are not really seen, the layers that compute those intermediate variables are called hidden layers. So here, for example, how many hidden layers do we have in this structure to the left? Anyone? How many? Two. And the one to the right? Three. Okay. So now we are speaking of deep networks. The title of the class is, you know, deep learning, right? So what do I mean by a deep network? Does anybody know? Pardon me? How many? Larger than or equal to? You're right. So, how many? So, uh, how, you, you, some, at least some of you have done graph theory, right? One of the basic concepts for a directed acyclic graph is the notion of the depth of a graph. Have you heard of that? Right. What's the depth of a graph? What is the depth of a graph? Well, let me help you, right? So if I have a directed graph, it has sources and it has sinks, and the depth of a graph is the length of the longest path from source to sink. So the figure to the left and the figure to the right, both are directed graphs. What is the depth of the graph to the left? Two, 
right? Come on, guys, speak up. Otherwise, I'll wait for you. And this is true because although I have a path of length one from source to sink, I also have a path of length two. The greater of the two is two, so the depth of this graph is two. The depth of the graph to the right, what is that? Three, right? The longest path is three. So when I speak of a neural network, typically in a multi-layer perceptron, MLP, but it doesn't even have to be layer -wise, a layer-wise network, the network has an input, it has an output, it's a directed graph. That graph has a depth. And if the depth is greater than two, greater than or equal to three, we call it a deep network. So there's a formal definition for a deep network. It has at least three layers, right? Or the depth is three or more. So now, in the last class, we saw that a multilayer perceptron can do all kinds of things. It can work on either Boolean or real stimuli. It can produce either Boolean or real outputs. And it can have more than one output. Now, what can this network compute? What kind of relationships can these networks compute? We went through this in the last class. Anybody remember? What kinds of networks? Uh, relations. Pardon me? Can it compute any Boolean function? It can compute pretty much any Boolean function. How about classification boundaries? Can, you, can it compute any classification boundary? Pretty much yes, right? Can it accurately compute pretty much any real function? Not quite. It can approximate it, right? You remember, remember we do these steps. In the limit, it would match the function, but in anywhere else, it's going to be an approximation, right? So MLPs approximate functions. They can compose Boolean functions. They can compose real-valued functions. They can compose classification boundaries. But what are the limitations? That's what we're going to go through today, right? We know that multilayer perceptrons are universal Boolean functions. We're going to understand this a little more. And we're going to ask the question, why depth? We know they're universal classifiers, but we're going to address the issue of why depth. We know they're universal approximators. They can approximate pretty much any function. We'll see this again. We'll, we'll, we'll understand all of this all over again. And again, we're going to discuss the issue of depth versus width. There's a bit at the end that I'm not really going to cover, but this is on the slides, and it's going to show up in your quiz, which is RBF networks. Okay? So let's start with this business of universal Boolean functions. How well do MLPs model Boolean functions? We already know that a single perceptron can model any Boolean gate, right? The one over here, we have the equivalent of, uh, what's that? To the top left, that's an AND. The one to the right is an OR. The one at the bottom middle, oh no, one to the right is a, is a NOT, right? And the one in the middle bottom is a, is a NOT, OK. These are simple gates. In fact. The re, uh, you'll recall that we said uh, 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 Rosenblatt thought these things could compute pretty much any function. Why did he think that? So let's look at some other kinds of functions that this can compute. This, can com this is a un uh, threshold function can be a universal AND gate. So for example, if I have N inputs, I can say that this network, this unit must fire only if inputs 1 through L are 1 and the rest of the inputs are zero, but not otherwise, right? Can you see why this, un why this unit does that? Anybody? Someone want to tell me why this one would do it? Do you want to take a guess? Um, so it comes from one to L. They are all like positive weight. So if they are all ones, then they will produce L. Mm -hmm. And from L, to L plus one to N, they all have like negative gait. So the only way they can produce non-negative number is all false. Exactly. So because inputs 1 through L have weight 1, if all of them are 1, the total input is going to be 1. The remaining inputs have weight minus 1. If any of them turns on, the sum is going to become less than L. So the only condition under which this one is going to fire is if the first L are 1 and the remaining are 0, right? Or I can have something like this, the universal OR gate. If any of inputs 1 through L are 1, or if any of in the inputs L plus 1 through N, I mean, if any of inputs 1 through L are 1, or if any of the remaining inputs are 0, this will fire, and not otherwise, right? Can anybody explain why this is so? Right, you want to take a guess? Yeah. 
the way to think about it is to invert the process. What happens if you have the exact opposite, right? All of the all of inputs one, the, the first tail inputs are zero, and the remaining inputs are one. In that case, what is the total? The first tail are going to give you zero. There are n minus l inputs at the bottom. So if everything is the exact inverse of what you want, the total input coming in is n minus l. If any one of them flips, that sum is going to increase. Correct? Because if, if any of the lower half become one, zero, then the minus one no longer contributes. If any of the upper half become one, that is going to contribute. And so if I have a threshold of L minus N plus one, this guarantees that I, any of the first L must be one or any of the remaining must be zero, right? So beautiful, this is very powerful. Here's something much more powerful than it can do, that it can do. It's a generalized majority gate. It says if any of the K, if any K inputs are one, this will fire. Right? Now it turns out that in order to model this majority gate using a standard Boolean circuit, you would need an exponentially sized circuit. But you can do this with a single threshold gate. So obviously these things are ridiculously powerful, right? But then it cannot compute an XR. We already saw this. In spite of all of this magical ability to compute stuff, it cannot compute an XR. On the other hand, if you begin networking them, you can compute an XR. We also saw that. And therefore, you can compute all kinds of hideous functions like this one with an appropriately networked collection of threshold gates. Right? But then, let's, so MLPs are universal Boolean functions. That we agree, right? But when I speak of MLPs, I'm speaking of multi-layer perceptrons. So this horrible function to the left, how many layers does that, does that network have? Come on, guys, help me. I can't see the screen. Yes. Two layers? Speak up. Three layers, right? You can actually see three layers all the way to the output. That's two hidden layers and an output, output layer, correct? The one to the right has four layers. Now. For any arbitrary Boolean function, can you tell me how many layers the network, or can you tell me of some way of computing how many layers the network will actually require to compute it? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Two layers? Any function at all? Three layers? Excluding? Yeah, the input we will not consider a layer for now. Yes? It's a Boolean function. So he's the only one who has it right, right? Uh, what's your name? Shreyas. Shreyas, okay, Shreyas has it right. And let me tell you why. Any Boolean function is a truth table. Do you agree? I can explicitly list out every combination of inputs and write out the output. But then here's what, here's what I can do. I don't need to list every combination and its output. I only need to list the specific combinations for which the output is one. For the rest, the output is implicitly zero, right? So any Boolean function can be expressed as this truth table. What is a nice compact way of representing a truth table? Anybody heard of this term, DNF formula? What's a DNF formula? Disjunctive normal form. How many clauses would the DNF formula for this table have? Anyone? Six. A naive rep you know, construction of a DNF formula for this is going to have six clauses. And let's see how. I can, that's what the function is going to look like. Now look at what the first clause says. The first clause says that the output is one if x1 is zero, x2 is zero, x3 is one, x4 is one, and x5 is zero, correct? which is the equivalent of saying not x1, not x2, x3, x4, and not x5. The second clause says the output is zero if x1 is zero, x2 is one, x3 is zero, x4 is one, and x5 is one. So it's not x1, x2, not x3, x4, and x5. So each one of the rows of the table becomes a clause in my DNF formula. And there is no other combination under which the output is one, so the formula has only six clauses. And now, each clause is modelable, it's just an AND, right? So which means I can model it using a very simple single perceptron. So I'm going to have one perceptron per clause. 
And then what do I do? I have a final perceptron which ors the lot, and there I have it. I have expressed this entire truth table using a single hidden layer, just two layers. What does this mean? A one hidden layer MLP is a universal Boolean function. You can compute pretty much any Boolean function using just one hidden layer, uh, an MLP with just one hidden layer, right? That's all very great. But how large is that layer going to be in the worst case? Exponentially large, right? And why would that be? So let's to understand that, let's go back and think of how, uh, you know, how you actually represent Boolean functions as DNF formulae. Now, to explain it, I'm going to invoke something called a Carnot map. How many of you have heard of a Carnot map? Right, so at least some of you. If you're, if you're an electrical engineer, you know what a Carnot map is. If you're a computer scientist, you're supposed to know what, your Carnot map, what a Carnot map is, but then shame on you, you don't, right? Uh, so a Carnot map is a topological way of representing input combinations. So here, this is a function of four variables. So the columns represent all combinations of y, z. The rows represent all combinations of x, z, x, w, x. Observe that any two adjacent columns differ in exactly one bit. Any two adjacent rows differ in exactly one bit, which means that the two columns at the end actually touch each other. The two, the two rows at the ends touch each other. This shape is actually a torus. It's not a sheet. And if you take any two adjacent boxes, they differ in one bit. So it's a nice topological representation of all possible input combinations. And this is actually a truth table. Every highlighted box is one input combination for which the output is one. So how many clauses would, would the uh, DNF formula for this guy require? In the worst case, yes. Worst case. Seven, correct? But then now I can begin grouping things. So in the worst case, this is going to require seven terms. But then I can begin grouping things. If you look at the first column, what the first column tells me is that regardless of the combination of wx, the output is one. So I can group all of them, right? Similarly, you look at that little ellipse in the middle. It tells me that the regardless, regardless of the value of y, I can, the output is going to be one for that, part of, for that combination of w, I mean, regardless of the value of z, right? So for that combination of w, x, and y. Similarly, in fact, I can group all four corners and I get another grouping of this kind. So which means that the actual DNF formula is going to be uh, not y, not z, which represents the first column, uh, not w, x, not w, y, which represents the green ellipse. And this is a suboptimal formula. I've grouped those guys in the, in, to, the, to the extreme right. It's not x, y, not z. So this DNF formula only requires three clauses, right? So long as I can begin grouping things in the Carnot map, I can reduce the number of clauses and make a fairly compact Boolean formula, which means I can make a fairly compact one hidden layer neural network. What is the worst case here? Chessboard, right? So this is what, so this, is what this guy would look like. But the largest irreducible DNF is going to be this guy, right? I cannot group anything. So if I want to do this with one hidden layer, how many neurons will I require in the hidden layer? Eight, there are 16 boxes. I cannot group them, so I need eight, right? So a one hidden layer MLP for this guy is going to require eight layers. Now here's a three-dimensional version of, uh, of a Carnot map. This actually has six variables. It has all the same properties of the other one, but this is a four-dimensional, this is a toroid in 4D space, all right? Every alternate box is a one. How many units would I require, how, how many in my hidden layer to model this function? There are 64 boxes, I'm gonna need 32, correct? But, so in general, if I have n inputs, in the worst case, the, I can require two raised to n minus one perceptrons in the head and layer for this particular function, which is exponential in n, right? So which is why we said that although you can compose any function using just one head and layer, the worst case complexity of that function is actually exponential in the size of the input. 
But then, if I use multiple layers, how can I do this? Does anybody recognize the function over here? What is this function? Anyone? Yeah. It's an XOR, right? So the first one is a WXOR, X, XOR, Y, XOR, Z. The second one is a UXOR, VXOR, WXOR, XXOR, YXOR, Z. How many neurons do I need to compose an XOR? Three. So how many neurons would I need to compose the function to the left? Three per XOR, nine. Correct? Three per XOR to the right. So remember, this is your XOR. In fact, you can do this with two neurons. You don't even need three. But we won't get into this, OK? Which means that function can be modeled like so. Correct? 15 neurons. Uh, this is what? Nine neurons. This guy is modeled like, like so. 15 neurons, right? So what this means is that an XOR of n variables will require three times n minus one new perceptrons, which is linear in n. So a single hidden layer is going to require two raised to n minus one plus one for the final guy, perceptrons and all, which is exponential in n. But if I dis I'll permit myself to go deep, that sucks. the complexity of the network actually increases linearly with n which is pretty phenomenal if you think about it, right? Now, how deep do I need to be? In the examples that we just saw, I was using one, two layers per XOR, correct? So if I had n variables, I was, I was using two times n minus one layers. Do I really need to do that? No, XOR is associative, correct? So because the XOR is associative, I can actually begin grouping things. I can group pairs of elements. So I can compute an XOR of the first two variables. I can compute an XOR of the next two variables. Then I can compute the XOR of the result. I can keep grouping things. So in this case, how many layers will I have? Two times log two of n. Correct? And so I can, the actual, so long as I, I have a network of depth two times log two of n, I can assure you that there exists an architecture that will model this in do you mind shutting that off? Right. I know, but hmm? the point is, I know I, you're looking at the slides. The guy at the back, I have no clue what he's looking at, right? So uh, by the way, just check PRZ if there are any questions at any point, right? Uh, now, so what this means is that so long as I have a minimal number of layers, I can assure you that the size of the network actually increases, best case size of the network is linear in N. But then something interesting happens. Observe this. What is really happening is this. This is a hierarchy of XORs, correct? I have, a, I have n over 2 XORs in the first layer. Then I have two layers. Then I have n over 4 XORs. Then I have n over 8 XORs. So I keep having more and more layers of XORs. Suppose I decide that this network is only allowed to have three, layer, three hidden layers. Then what happens? In the best case, all I can do is to compute an XOR at the first layer of the first, uh, you know, the first group of XORs, and subsequently I have only one more hidden layer, and that hidden layer is actually now computing an XOR. How large can it be? It's exponential, right? What this means is that there is an optimal depth of the network. If you go below that optimal depth, up to which the network size is going to stay linear on the inputs, but if you go below that, it's going to blow up exponentially. Right? Yes? So that 3 times n minus 1 bound, is that only for x or any boolean bound? Everything over here is going to be, I'm hand waving. Everything I've said is accurate so far within the, I mean, it's correct, but there are better bounds. We'll get to that, OK? Even the log uh, depth. Yeah. So, but the point I was trying to make is the importance of depth over here, OK? So the actual, now keep in mind that the actual number of important parameters is the number of connections, not so much the number of neurons, right? And uh, this is really, in this example, there are 30 connections. This is the number that really matters in software or hardware uh, implementations. Networks that require an exponential number of neurons are going to require either an exponential or a super, super exponential number of edges, right? 
So a quick recap, deep MLPs that scale linearly with the number of inputs can become exponentially large if recast using one layer or even recast using a fixed number of layers where the depth of the layer is independent of the size of the input. And it gets worse. It's not just XORs. If there's any function which can be expressed as some preliminary computation followed by an XOR, the same result holds, correct? So what is the real trade-off? I was just trying to explain, give you a conceptual idea of what, we, what happens. If you want to get really rigorous, things are a lot more complex. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, uh, want you to believe that I've given you all there is uh, to it. It turns out that the XOR is really a parity problem, and any Boolean circuit of depth D using only Boolean gates and with unbounded fan in must have a size of 2 raised to n raised to 1 over D, uh, regardless of n, right? This is the best you can actually do. So uh, this is uh, alternately stated the parity function is not an AC0. The AC0 class of circuits is the class of circuits of fixed depth, OK? Now, here, the uh, visual interpretation of the XOR was kind of clean. The reality is actually much worse. Not all Boolean circuits have such clear depth versus size trade-off. There's a very nice uh, theorem by Shannon. We'll link Shannon's paper to the course page, where it says that for n greater than 2, there is a Boolean function of the n variables that requires at least 2 raised to n over n gates. This is regardless of the depth. But then it's even more interesting. It says that for large n, or with a probability of approaching 1, the function that you're trying to model requires 2 raised to n over n neurons, which means that any arbitrarily choose, chosen Boolean function really needs an exponential uh, number of neurons. So everything that I've said about depth so far, even that is not sufficiently valid, right? There are functions which are going to, uh, which, which are going to violate everything that we're talking about. We are not particularly concerned about those. The lesson, the take-home lesson we really are trying to take get over here is that depth can increase, making the network deep can really, really, really make your modeling much, much better, right? Uh, fact is that if all Boolean functions over, over n inputs could be computed using a circuit of polynomial size, leave alone linear, that would mean that p equals np, right? So here's a summary. An MLP is a universal Boolean function, but can represent a given function only if it is sufficiently wide, we already saw that, and sufficiently deep. And depth can be traded off with uh, the width sometimes. The optimal width and depth depend on the number of variables and the complexity of the Boolean function itself. Okay. So here's the story so far. MLPs are universal Boolean machines. Even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal Boolean machine. We saw that. Deeper networks may require far fewer neurons, exponentially fewer neurons, than shallower networks to express the same function. Okay. Some caveats. I've used a Boolean circuit for an anal analogy because I composed everything using Boolean gates. But what a, Boole a, a perceptron is is not a Boolean gate. It's actually a threshold gate. And a perceptron can compute Boolean operations. A single perceptron can compute Boolean operations that would actually require an exponential number of Boolean gates to compute. So uh, for example, uh, a uh, simple threshold gate can compute the majority function. A Boolean function uh, for that is going to be exponentially large, right? So what this means is, is that at depth two, threshold gate parity circuit can actually be composed with order n squared weights as opposed to, you know, exponential in n. So that's something I haven't. Uh, you have to be care. Now this is just a caveat. Don't take everything that is there on the slides as the absolute ground truth. There's more to it. But more generally. For most Boolean functions, a threshold circuit that's polynomial at the optimal depth will become exponentially large if you just reduce one layer from that optimal depth. That is your take, that is that, that is your take home lesson. Now, other formal uh, analyses typically view neural networks as arithmetic circuits. So let's consider functions over the field of reals. Now, we know the MLP is a universal classifier. 
We saw this in the last class. You can design pretty much any uh, decision boundary, right? And this has to do with the fact that your perceptron is a linear classifier, but what it really computes is this step function, which, who's ha which has an output of zero on one side of a hyperplane, then it jumps up and becomes an output of one on the other side of the hyperplane, right? But once we have something of this kind, we can compose all kinds of uh, uh, Boolean functions. So the function to the left, we saw that we can use that to, co to compose the OR function or the NOT function. And to the extreme right, we have a function that cannot be composed by a simple perceptron because it goes up and then comes back down, whereas, whereas a perceptron is only a one-sided uh, uh, function, which is why for the, for the figure to the top right, you actually needed a network of perceptrons. But then having found that we can actually compute these simple boundaries, we also saw that we could compose more complicated decisions, decision boundaries, like this pentagon. So I can now compose a multi-layer perceptron, which gives you a one inside the pentagon and a zero outside. And we saw how we can do this. I'd have one perceptron to compute the uh, lowest boundary. The output would be zero below the boundary and one on top of it. Another perceptron to compute this guy here. The output is going to be zero to the right and one to the left. The third one is going to be this perceptron. Output is zero to the top, one to the bottom. This is the fourth, this is the fifth. And then if I sum their outputs, the uh, sum of their outputs is going to be five inside the pentagon and zero everywhere else. And if I use a threshold of five and I slice off the, uh, the uh, output, I'm gonna get my pentagon as my function, right? The output is going to be one inside the pentagon and zero outside. And once you do that, you can actually compute more complex functions like this guy. We saw how. Uh, if I want the output to be one inside either of the two pentagons and zero outside, I'd have one subnet to compute the first pentagon, another subnet to compute the second pentagon, I order the two, I get my output, right? And now I can have more complex decision boundaries like this guy. And the way I would do it, uh, I could, for example, for the figure to the left, I could slice it up into many little polytopes. I can uh, have one little subnet for every single polytope, and I can order the lot, and I'm going to get my crazy decision boundary, right? This we've already seen. So, in all of these cases, we had two hidden layers. And we can actually show that if you have more than two hidden layers, it actually gets even better, right? Can you do this with just one hidden layer? In fact, instead of giving you this horrible example, let me give you something much simpler. Can we do this? And how? Anyone want to take a, take a guess? Anybody? You guys at the back, you want to take a guess? Can you do this? Do you think it's possible to do this with just one hidden layer? You there. Yeah, what's your name? I'm Ryan. Ryan, yeah. Uh, yes. Anybody else? You? Okay. Uh, yes, that's the answer that I, the answer that I really require, right? And to do this, I'm going to sort of simplify the problem. Let me try to compute a diamond as a decision boundary. How many neurons do I need in the hidden layer? If I use only one hidden layer, come on, guys. Ryan, how many would I need? If I want the diamond as the decision boundary, four, correct? But then I have one for each boundary and I'm going to sum the output. But for the same circuit, if I use three as a threshold as opposed to four, what is the decision boundary gonna look like? It's no longer convex, right? It's actually this crazy little shape. So don't imagine that you can only get convex shapes. You can get pretty much any other shape, right? But then what is the area in which it will fire if I use a threshold of three? It's infinite, correct? 
because both all of these strips go off all the way to the end. Now let me compose a pentagon. The pentagon is going to require five perceptrons. I'm going to sum their output. If I use a threshold of five, I get the pentagon. But if I use a threshold of four, I get a star. The area of the star is not infinite, right? It's finite. Now, if I compute the ratio of the area of the star to the area of the pentagon, that's much better than the ratio of the area that I got when I used a threshold of three versus the diamond in this example, correct? So if I just use a threshold which is three as opposed to four, the decision area that I would get, if I took the ratio of that area to the area of the diamond, here it was infinite. In the case of the pentagon, it's finite. If I go up to the hexagon, it's going to be smaller still, right? I'm getting to something. Can anybody guess where I'm getting? Yeah? It'll turn into? So it's going to turn to zero, turn into one, correct? So what this means, so here's what happens. If I look at a heptagon, if you look at the sums in the different regions, if you look at the region where the sum is six, that's much smaller as a fraction of the bigger picture, right? If I look at 16 sides, this is what the output looks like. If I look at 64 sides, here's what it looks like. If I look at 1,000 sides, here's what it looks like. And as I keep increasing the number of sides, the, the uh, area outside the polygon where the sum is less than n or, or, and lies between n and n over 2 keeps decreasing, right? In the limit, that function actually has this crazy shape, which is, I won't even bother to read the function, but it actually looks like a cylinder with an, ex with an exponentially falling off side. In the limit, that's going to be a perfect cylinder. If the cylinder is small enough, it's going to be a perfect cylinder, right? I have control over the radius. So here's the interesting thing. It's flat within the circle, and then it's falling off exponentially outside the circle. It's convenient to think of it as being almost a perfect cylinder. For a very large n, that is an almost perfect cylinder, right? Where the sum is n inside and n over 2 outside. So if I just took many, many, many perceptrons to compute all of the individual sides, and then added their output, the sum of their outputs is going to be n inside the cylinder and n over 2 outside the cylinder. Now, this doesn't make me happy because it doesn't really help me. What I really want is something that is n over 2 inside the cylinder and 0 outside, or better still, 1 inside the cylinder and 0 outside. So how can I do this? I add a bias, right? If I add a bias, now I cancel out the n over 2. And I, can also, I could also divide everything, but let's, let's leave that out. So the resulting figure is a cylinder that gives me, so I have one network, right, which takes in these two inputs, and it produces a figure which looks like this, correct? A perfect cylinder. I can design a second network exactly like this, which produces a cylinder elsewhere, correct? Observe that I have no activation at the outputs. I'm just summing the outputs, correct? So what would happen if instead of summing them here, I sum them all out here? The sum is going to have this figure. It's 0 everywhere. It's n over 2 inside the first cylinder and n over 2 inside the second cylinder. Right? If I use a threshold of n over 2, what is the decision boundary going to look like? Two disconnected circles. So if I chop them up, that's what your network is going to look like. Now I have one network with two n inputs in the hidden layer. And they're all being summed. And I have one perceptron at the output. The decision boundary is now actually two circles, disconnected circles. Correct? Which tells me how I can compose this with one hidden layer. I'm going to need a ridiculously large number of these guys. Is the approximation going to be perfect? No. But I can approach the decision boundary to arbitrary precision. 
right? I can make it arbitrarily accurate. So in other words, this is MLPs are universal approximators. They're not approxi one hidden layer MLPs are not universal functions. They are universal approximators. You give me the function, you give me the decision boundary, I can make the fun I can compose an MLP with only one hidden layer that approaches this, that decision boundary to any precision that you ask of me. Right? Questions? No, okay. So, but then, so we said it approximates the universal classifier. Where does depth come in? Observe how many neurons we wanted when we wanted, when we had only one hidden layer versus, versus how many neurons we wanted when we have more than one hidden layer. And it goes from being almost infinite and only giving you an approximation to being very finite in size and giving you an exact answer. So although having fewer neurons, fewer layers will give you a pretty good approximation, just adding a little bit of depth can make a tremendous difference to the size of the network. So how deep must the network be? Uh, formal analyses typically view these networks as a category of arithmetic circuits, which compute polynomials over any field. So if you think of it in terms of polynomials, then uh, Leslie Valiant has this nice result which says that a polynomial of degree n requires a network of at least log squared n layers. And if you reduce the size of the, the depth of the network by even one layer, it's going to become exponentially large. So we've seen optimal depth in generic nets. We've looked at uh, some worst case decision boundaries, but then we've looked at these four threshold networks. It generalizes to other networks. But then let's take a look at uh, you know, everything that we saw was in terms of Boolean functions are very simple decision boundaries, right? Let's take a look at uh, some more complex patterns to get an idea of how deep these networks must be. Now, let's say I want a decision boundary of this kind. It's a, over a two-dimensional input. I want the output to be one in the yellow regions. I want it to be zero in the gray regions. Now, if I were to naively compose a MLP for this decision boundary, how many neurons would I require? Anyone? We just saw that, didn't we? It's going to be? If I want to naively compose this one hidden layer neural network, I can approximate it to arbitrary precision, but I'm going to need nearly infinite neurons, correct? So not very good. But then, suppose I do this with two hidden layers. I claim this can be done with 56 neurons. Why is that? Anyone? You want to take a guess? Um, I think you can like have like a MLP for each square or each figure, and then all the answers so inside ones can be like I mean the um, like comparison. So, anyone else? You guys at the back? The girl in the center. Why do I say 56? You. It's not a chessboard, right? And it's not. So, this is an input on reals, correct? There's a function on real. So here's how I break it down. Observe that the entire network is composed of only 16 lines. So I would need 16 perceptrons, one for every line. I have eight hashes lines this way, eight lines this way, right? So 16 lines will give me the basic 16 basic building blocks. And once I have decided, each of these perceptrons will tell me which side of the line I actually am on. And once I know that, 
I can begin combining those to pick the individual boxes. And I have 50, I have 40 boxes, yellow boxes. So each box will require one perceptron. And then I'm going to need the final output layer, which ors these boxes, which tells me that, uh, you know, if I'm in any of the highlighted yellow regions. So this entire circuit is going to happen with 40 plus 16 plus 1, which is 57 total neurons. Right? Yeah. Uh, what is each neuron in the second hidden neuron? Let's say each neuron in the hidden, each neuron is picking up one highlighted yellow region. Right? So, so for example, I'm going to need one neuron for this guy. Remember, for, for this guy. Remember, we, are, we saw how uh, two layers can, uh, can compose, a poly, uh, compose a polygon, right? I'm literally composing 40 polygons and ordering the lot. So I have 57 neurons in all. Yes? Because there are eight lines this way and eight lines this way. The lines are independent. Correct. So if you are, the size can be reduced, but I'm, but this is illustrative. There are 16 independent lines. Correct. So, but then, this is a pattern that we've already seen, right? If I think of the 16 lines as giving me 16 variables, this is, uh, which are y1 through y16, this is just an XOR over the lot. And I can build a little XOR uh, network over, over these 16 inputs. In this particular case, it turns out it's not a very good idea because an XOR network over 16 inputs is going to require, actually, I can do this with two neurons. So it's going to require 30 plus 16, 46 neurons, which is not a terrible uh, advantage over 57. Right. Now, but then, if I make the pattern more complex, now, I'm giving you these very simple, trivial two-dimensional patterns. When you go into high dimensions, the patterns are going to be arbitrarily complex. And a better illustration of what you actually are going to get is something like this. Now, this is the two-dimensional equivalent of a complex pattern in higher dimensions, which, of which any two-dimensional two slice might, like, might look simple. But the totality of the high-dimensional pattern is going to be very complex, right? And now this guy. Again, a naive one hidden layer neural network is going to require infinite hidden neurons, right? But this is in fact composed of 64 basic linear feature detectors. And then in the second layer, I have 544 boxes. So this entire thing can be done with 609 total neurons, right? Now, don't get too hung up on this particular example. I'm going to use this to, to, to present uh, a uh, different idea, but just hang on to the example. So now, again, if I do this using XORs, this is really going to require 16 times, uh, 64 times 2, 128, 128 plus 64. How much is that? Uh, 196. So I could do this with 196 neurons if I did this using an XOR network, whereas if I do it naively, uh, or uh, if I use three neurons per XOR, it's going to be 253 neurons, just because I got some depth. Whereas if I did it flat, then that's going to require over 600 neurons, right? So again, the point is the number of neurons required in a shallow network is potentially exponential, and the number of di in the dimensionality of the input. Now, something over here. I, earlier, I said earlier that if you have a chessboard, you're going to require an exponential number of neurons, correct? But in this example, did I really require an exponential number of neurons? Here, for instance, was the number of neurons exponential in 16? Although I added only one more layer. No, I just needed 50 in the second layer, correct? 40 in the second layer. Why is that? Why did I require only 40 in the second layer? Uh, 
Anyone want to take a guess? It turns out the 16 feature detectors you had in the first layer are not statistically independent. What do I mean by this? So if I have two lines like this, if you are to the right of this line, you are also to the right of this line. So each of them informs about the other, correct? The moment these features become in statistically related, the actual number of neurons you're going to require will go down very fast. But instead of having 16 lines in two planes, in a two-dimensional plane, if I had 16 lines in a 16-dimensional space, I would actually require an exponential number of neurons. You get what I'm talking about, right? So, uh, so what this really means is that the number of neurons grows exponentially not with the number of individual features, but with the number of statistically independent individual features, or alternately with the number of, di with the number of dimensions of the actual input space. Right? Okay. So, story so far, multilayer perceptrons are universal Boolean functions. Even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal Boolean function. They are, they are universal classification engines, which compute uh, even a network with a single hidden layer is a universal classifier. But a single layer network may require an exponentially large number of perceptrons, whereas a deep one would not. And in fact, deeper networks may require far fewer neurons than shallower networks to express the same function. They could be exponentially fewer, right? So deeper networks, you can say, are more expressive than shallow networks. Now, again, we are still speaking of classification, but then what about real-valued functions, universal approximators, right? So we've already seen that they can not only express Boolean functions, they can express classification, class classification boundaries. But we saw in the last class that an MLP can also express a real-valued function of one variable. How did we do that? We first composed this little, uh, this little uh, step, this little pulse. And then if you wanted to compute any one-dimensional function, you just packed a whole lot of, these, lot of these pulses, and you could approximate it to arbitrary precision. But this is for a variable function of one variable. How would you expand this to a function of two variables? Because now, your function is going to look, wait, like this. Right. You're going to have some two-dimensional space, and you're going to have some surface. How are you going to model this function? Obviously, this simple theory is not going to work, right? So how would you do it? Cylinders. I can fit an arbitrary number of cylinders under it. Perfect. Right, remember, I can compose a cylinder. And so now I can have, I can fill this space with cylinders, scale them to different heights, and add them all up. And I can compose pretty much any real valued function to arbitrary precision using just one hidden layer. Right? Of course. Using more than one hidden layer is going to give you uh, uh, more uh, expressivities. But the MLP is a universal approximator in any, any number of dimensions. Now, in here, I just assumed that I'm summing the outputs of all of the individual subnets which compute in individual cylinders. So the final net, the final neuron has a linear activation, which means to say that the affine combination is not being transformed in any manner, right? In a standard perceptron, what do we have? When everything is added up, you eventually have some kind of an activation that operates on the perceptron, correct? So to be more precise, what we really, you know, typically the final sum is going to be put through things like sigmoids, tan H's, relus, what have you. So when I think of the network as a function, what it means is that 
Uh, the network is actually a universal map from the entire domain of individual values to the entire range of the output activation function. So if the output activation is a sigmoid, it means that the output can only lie between 0 and 1, right? So which means that if I decide that the output activation is a sigmoid, then I can compose an MLP that can model any function or approximate any function from my input space to the domain which lies between 0 and 1. If the output is a rare output activation, yes. Um, so, like if the domain is unbounded, then we can't put cylinders up to infinity. Right? In theory, when you speak, if you're, if you're allowing yourself to have infinite cylinders, right? Yes, you're quantizing it, but yeah. So, in reality, you never really deal with these. You're still, you're still speaking of conceptual. No, but so. like, uh, like if our domain goes up to infinity. And we are still speaking of infinite cylinders. You're just beginning to compare types of infinity. So at that point, you're in a purely theoretical space, but yes, you can model it, right? So the MLP is a universal approximator for the entire class of functions that it represents, where it represents a class of functions from some domain to some range, right, or some codomain. Now, questions so far? Yeah. Why can we not use a Q word instead of a cylinder? Pardon me? Why can we not use a Q word instead of a cylinder? Think about it. Because if you want to use a cuboid, first you need to compose a cuboid, which is zero inside the cuboid and one, uh, one inside the cuboid and zero outside. And we found that's not, half point, that's not feasible, right? When you try to compose a cuboid, you're gonna get, you know, Four in the in the inside the inside the uh, uh, say in, on t in two dimensions you'd get four inside the diamond, but you're going to get three, two, and one outside, and those will interact, right? If I if, so, if I put two cuboids side by side, the three for one cuboid and the three for the next cuboid are going to add up. Right. So. Uh, now, here's the business of, the final business of depth, right? In the previous discussion, we've seen that a single hidden layer MLP is a universal function approximator. It can approximate any function to arbitrary precision, although it might require infinite neurons in the layer. More generally, deeper networks will require fewer neurons than the, for the same approximation error. So if you give yourself a certain bound on the error, if you go deep, you're going to require far fewer neurons. And they can be exponentially fewer. The number of neurons can be exponentially fewer than a one hidden layer network. But then there are restrictions, right? A neural network can represent any function provided it has sufficient capacity, it's provided it's sufficiently broad and sufficiently deep. And this must hold at every layer. So to understand this, not all architectures can represent any function. To understand this, let's look at this example which comprises 16 lines, and you have a checkerboard over 16 lines, right? So to compose it, you actually require 16 neurons in the first layer, and then you can have stuff in, the, stuff in subsequent layers. You can have one or two or how many ever layers, right? But instead of having 16 neurons in the first layer, suppose I had only eight neurons in the first layer. Would I be able to compose this guy by having many more layers afterwards and many more neurons? I let you use infinite neurons in the second, in the second hidden layer on but I restrict you to eight neurons in the first layer. Can you compose this function? I'm assuming we're using threshold activations. Can you compose it? Anybody? You? So you cannot, right? You cannot, absolutely. So what really happens is this. So let's say if I just had only eight neurons, and let's say those eight neurons captured the eight lines over there. Then what would happen is that the first neuron is going to tell me whether I'm to the right of this guy or to the left of this guy, but it won't tell me where I am. Only that I'm to the right, correct? The second neuron is going to tell me if that I'm to the left of this guy or to the right of this guy. So by the time you get to the second layer, the only information you have is about your position 
with respect to these guys, which means you do not distinguish between this point and this point, that information is lost. Now I cannot compose the other cross hashes. Right, the information is gone. Right? Looking puzzled? Or that makes sense? Right? So let's say my first eight neurons, so this is all I can compose. So suppose I cleverly manage to do this. So I managed to put four of my neurons composing this hash and four of them composing these lines. I'm still lost. Why is that? Because what will happen is now I can find out which of these stripes I'm in. I can find out which of these stripes I'm in. So I can tell you that I'm in this box, but within this box, all the positions are the same. Information is lost. So now I cannot actually add information to this as I go further down the network, right? So what this means is that I really do need 16 neurons in that first layer for me to be able to compose this pattern. If I give you only 15 neurons, it doesn't matter that I'm allowed to use an infinity of neurons downstream, I cannot compose this, compose this pattern, right? Same thing at the second neuron, the second layer. In the second layer, here I need 40 neurons. If I only give you 25 neurons in the second layer, it doesn't matter how many neurons I give you for the downstream. You are not going to be able to compose this network, right? So not only is depth required, every individual layer has to be sufficiently wide. But there's, there, there, there's a caveat over here. I made a magical, uh, so again, these slides are just saying the same story, right? I made an assumption that we are using the threshold activation. And one of the properties of the threshold activation is that it loses information. Once you cross the threshold, it doesn't tell you how far you are from the threshold, right? Now, we've been talking so far about different kinds of activations. Why should we worry about activations? What kind of activations are good? So to understand that, we had to work our way through the entire class to this particular example. Now, in, in this example, suppose I had only eight neurons in the first layer, right? But the activations were not threshold activations. The activation had some way of telling you how far away you are from the line. Then can I construct the rest of the pattern downstream? Because the information is there, right? The information has been retained. But not always, right? What happens if all eight of my neurons end up being this? Can I reconstruct it? No, the information is gone. So the any time you begin having an insufficient number of neurons, you are dependent a little bit on luck on getting them to capture appropriate information, appropriate structure. But if they do that, then if you have an activation that's not a simple threshold activation, but something like, say, a sigmoid, then you can hope that downstream structures can actually recover what the early structures did not, right? So given this, what kind of activation would be the best one? So let's say I, instead of a threshold, don't I have a fourth one? I believe I do. I don't know. Okay. So instead of just having a threshold, the, the problem with the threshold is that once I cross this boundary, it didn't tell me how far away I was from the boundary, okay? So suppose I replace it with a sigmoid. Is this good enough? Is this good enough? Yeah. Pardon me? You're really working with finite, or finite precision stuff, right? Beyond a point, it's not uh, effectively the uh, invertibility beyond these points is very, it's really not, you know, practically speaking, it's not invertible beyond a point, right? So a sigmoid will give you some information to some, to some distance from the boundary, but beyond that, it's not going to do so, right? What would be a good activation here? 
something that actually does this, right? It continues to give you information once you cross the boundary. Can you think, uh, think, of, a, think of an activation that's even better than that? Identity function. Uh, okay, what's wrong with the identity function? The, so it doesn't lose any information if uh, the number of layers becomes irrelevant because you can, you, you can collapse, compose a single linear function from any number of linear functions, right? You're going to end up with a hyperplane, that's it. Right, what else would be good? Pardon me? An absolute, an absolute value might be a good one. Something like this, right? What's wrong with absolute value? It doesn't really tell you which side you're on, right? So what else would be good? Two different slopes. Two different slopes. Turns out that's actually a very good activation function. We call this the leaky relu, right? And if you ever wonder about why that's an important, interesting function, you see exactly what is happening over here, yes? An identity introduces no nonlinearity, right? Eventually, regardless of how complex your network is, it's only going to model a hyperplane, right? I can take any number of, remember, it's affine combinations without activations, with identity activations. It's going to be affine combinations of affine combinations of affine combinations, which is just an affine combination. It's going to be a hyperplane, right? Okay. Exactly. Pardon me? Why is it so popular? Well, I don't know. It works. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's about the nonlinearity. It, it, uh, uh, for, for information, every time you lose information on one side, you're going, you can always compensate for it by another, another unit, which loses information by the, the other way, right? So you just increase the size of your network. Yeah. Can blow up to on the infinity side. In theory, for infinite, but uh, your inputs are not going to be infinite in the first place, right? And your networks are not infinite in size, so it won't blow up. Everything is finite. Yeah. Would that mean if you if you're able to work with a uh, leaky ReLU for say n units, you would be able to work with the ReLU for two n units? I would guess so. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so which is why something like this. These things, the, the uh, soft plus, the rectifier, the uh, uh, relus, the leaky relus, you expect them to actually be more useful than thresholds, and indeed they are, right? Now, so narrow layers can still pass information to subsequent layers if the activation function is sufficiently graded, but will require greater depth to permit later layers to capture patterns, right? Because you haven't taken decisions, you actually haven't morphed the function sufficiently early on, you're passing the work down to deeper, later layers. We will see in a later class that this is actually a good thing to do. If you're given 200 neurons, and if you have the choice between two, layer, two layers of size 100 and 50 layers of size 2, the latter is always more useful than the first. It's, learning it is hard, but the manner in which it expresses things is actually much more useful. Right? So the capacity of a network, as we defined it, has various definitions. We have the information or storage capacity, how many patterns it can remember, things like VC dimension and so on. From our perspective, it's the largest number of disconnected convex regions that uh, it can represent. If you think of it along those lines, then a lot of, uh, uh, of it, 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 the, lot of the intuitions you develop tend to be fairly good. And a network with insufficient capacity cannot exactly model a function that requires greater than a minimum number of convex hulls than the capacity of the network itself. But then what we find is the capacity of the network is a function of many variables. It's a function of the depth of, of the network. It's a function of the width of each layer of the network. It's also a function of the activation functions that you use and the pre precision of the arithmetic that you use. So, so 
as you can see, it's all very nice to have 80 minutes of lecture about the basic concepts. But where the rubber hits the road, there are so many variables that come in that, uh, that naive interpretations won't really help you very much. So there's, of course, a lot of theory on the topic. VC dimensions, it's a separate lecture. Uh, the, the VC dimension is the capacity of the network. Quiran and Sontag have uh, this uh, uh, very nice paper in 98. They show that for threshold units, the VC dimension of the network is proportional to the number of weights. Uh, Bartlett, Harvey, Leo, and Moravian uh, have uh, bounds for linear neural networks. There's a whole lot of work on linear neural networks where the activation functions are linear and which are probably the most useless neural networks you can actually use, right? It's very easy to come up with theories for useless stuff. Uh, the uh, best uh, recent results I have seen are by Gerald Friedland and Krell. There's a capacity scaling law for artificial neural networks. In 20, they have a paper in 2017 where they think of this in terms of bits, the number of bits you need to represent each weight. And uh, Gerald was actually down in the class and did a guest le lecture a couple of years ago. If I can, I'll try to attract him down again. So uh, their results are, results are actually interpretable because they have very, they have nice, very nice information theoretic results on what a model can represent and what its restrictions are. Anyway, we're kind of out of the topics for today. What we've seen so far is that MLPs are universal Boolean functions, universal classifiers, and universal function approximators. Even a single layer MLP can approximate anything to arbitrary precision, but could be exponentially or even infinitely wide in that one layer. Deeper MLPs can achieve the same precision with far fewer neurons. Deeper networks, that means deeper networks are more expressive. The actual capacity of the network is a function of many variables, including the precision of the arithmetic that you use, which is kind of scary if you think about it, right? Uh, and so next up, we know MLPs can emulate any function, but how do, how do you make them emulate specific functions? So how do you actually, you know that there is a function that can take an image as an input and produce a caption. How do you make an MLP model that function? We're going to look at that. The next few lectures are going to be about training multi-layer perceptrons. Questions? Thank you. <laughs>